Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, for holding this, uh, this hearing. I think a, lo a number of these issues, we can talk all day long about that, and so we're packing a lot in in a, in a very short period of time. And my first question is to uh, Mr. Mulligan and, and Ambassador Taylor. You will talk about the community engagement exercises and, and engaging credible voices throughout these communities. How do we blow that up? How do we, how do we make it bigger? How do we, how do we accelerate um, those projects? So we've been developing in partnership community awareness briefings, and we've just been moving it out fairly slowly initially to ensure that we're having a degree of success, but we have had some success in that, and now we're trying to train the trainer so that we can get into a situation where we're propagating it more broadly across the communities. Because going back to some of the other observations that have been made, it really is at the community level that we need to have this success. And, and also, we need to have I think, as the uh, ranking member said, levels between government and local. Uh, in a lot of instances, particularly with family members, as you know, people are reluctant to engage any sort of authorities, and we need to try and find that middle ground. So and, and, and I appreciate that, because we need to be thinking about this in terms of weeks, not years, yes. because that's, that's the speed at which we need to counter this, this, this threat. Uh, Ambassador Taylor, do you have remarks for that? Uh, I, and it's a global phenomenon. So mm -hmm. our outreach internationally has been uh, important as well. I'm uh, leading a delegation to Australia next week to further our communication with our Five Eyes partners about this phenomenon and how we can engage communities really across the world uh, to better so that they better understand what this risk threat is. Because in order to make the FBI's job a lot easier, this, this, this lone wolf idea, the, the way we're going to stop that is by countering that violent you know, ideology and, and extremist ideology, and, and that's going to take a whole of government effort. Who in the government is responsible for this, the CVE activity? Well, it's actually a shared responsibility between justice, uh, the intelligence community, DHS, and the FBI. And uh, our deputies meet uh, regularly to uh, formulate those strategies and to implement those strategies uh, within the within the U.S. Uh, my suggestion there would be looking at unity of commands, because when you have three people in charge of something, nobody's in charge of it. I, I think that's something that we're plagued with in, in the federal government on, on a number of occasions. And my next set of questions is to uh, Mr. Mr. Steinbach. The canon out there on, on counterterrorism is, is clear. Terrorists are trying to do two things. They're trying to kill a lot of people, and they're trying to elicit counterterrorism responses in a government to upset a population to foment discord. All right? And so with, with that as, as, as the background, that's why I'm, I'm a little bit nervous when we, when we start talking about Kalia expansion, all these kinds of things. Um, I, I get nervous um, because of the privacy aspect. So my, my question, and not to get too technical, does end-to-end -end encryption that's provided by many U.S. companies prevent your ability to do attribution? In some cases, yes. But not in all cases. Not in all cases. Right? Um, so are you suggesting that when you have a court order on someone connected to terrorism, that there are companies that aren't cooperating um, with helping to, to get as much information as they can about that individual? No, what I'm suggesting is the companies have built a product that doesn't allow them to help. But if you're saying it doesn't prevent attribution, and because the, the key here is to try to find as much information so that we can, you know, to, to, to exhibit the success that y'all have had in, Bo in Boston. You know, you were able to identify someone and use other tools to track him um, in order and, you know, and stop and prevent this fr from, from happening. And that's, you know, it, it's a difficult task. Don't get me wrong. I know how hard you guys are working. Maintaining the operational pace that y'all have maintained since September 11th is unprecedented. And you're the men and women in the FBI should be patted on the back and, and heralded. Um, but we also got to make sure that we're protecting our civil liberties and our, our borders at the same time. Um, and when you talk about reviewing applicable laws around the technology, the, the technology challenges that you are facing in Kali expansion, I, I just want to be clear, you're not talking about putting a backdoor in software, are you? No, like I said in my uh, prepared statement, sir, I'm talking about full transparency. I'm talking about going to the companies who then could help us uh, get the unencrypted information. And the attribution piece is important to understand that depending on the technology involved, this, and this requires, quite frankly, a technology discussion, there are tokens that are used that do not allow for attribution. So it's not quite as simple as um, just using other techniques or attribution. Sometimes that attribution is not there. And I'd be happy to discuss in a classified setting in more detail just exactly what we're talking about. 
I would love that, and, and thank you. And one of the things, we, we've been talking a lot about the use of social media and digital tools and how it's made it easier for ISIS to recruit people, but it also gives us uh, an opportunity to do double agent operations against them, to, to penetrate you know, their ability. When chasing Al Qaeda you know, 10 years ago, if you were anything close to an American, you were to get your, your throat slit. Now we have these new tools in order to penetrate them. And again, I know I, I, I've run out of, of time, um, and I yield back that to the chairman.